Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. Tonight we continue our conversation from last week on personal financial management with industry veteran Regina Sikalesile Vaka. Later on in the program, we conclude our conversation with Dr. Kieran Bagat on diabetes, a disease that is swiftly and silently gaining momentum across the globe and significantly impacting national economies in its wake. We get straight into it when we return. A few decades ago, a young Botswana could get a decent job without having completed their secondary education. Schemes such as Rent to Buy afforded young families the opportunity to own the roofs over their heads. I'm talking about the days in which the majority of plots for sale came in 40 by 40 meter sizes or even larger and one could actually find an affordable piece of land in Khaboroni. Times when a tertiary education practically guaranteed you a good job, as even our returning guest recalls. When I left university, the, 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 the options were limitless. I had four jobs that I could choose from. There are people in their 20s now who've been waiting for four years to get a job. Times are changing and our guest with decades of experience in the financial services sector says the way in which Botswana approach money management should also change in tandem. Last week, she educated us on how, despite how most people behave, the 20s are the perfect time one can acquire assets and investments because of limited responsibilities. She also said the 30s are an age in which we realize that we went to school to learn the wrong things. I always like to joke that, you know, we go to school to learn the wrong things because what we should be going to school to learn is life and how to live it and relationships and how to be parents and so on. But unfortunately we don't. So we find this out um, in our journey of life as we are growing up. This week we focus on the older 40 plus age bracket and learn how best this demographic can better manage their finances and whether these toughening economic times. Welcome back to the show as we discuss effective personal financial management. At the 40 year mark and above, we have seen many Botswana take on even more financial responsibilities. But Regina says this age should be a period of consolidation and slowing down. When you are in your 40s now, you are stabilizing. You are beginning to enter your middle age and some people are beginning to have midlife crises where you actually feel that everything you've ever done and everything you've ever achieved is the wrong thing. You wish you could start um, from scratch. So it's very important at that age to consolidate what you have. And mark you, I'm saying consolidate, because you are putting together all of these investment instruments that you've been having. And it's also important when you are in your 40s because unavoidably you might have taken some debt as well in order to fund the lifestyle that now includes the wife and the child and the car and the house and the fridge and the TV and so on. But when you are in your 40s, it's really time for you to start slowing down. What we see um, in this economy in particular is that when you are in your 40s, that's when you've reached like the, the peak of your career. And a lot of people think that that is the time because they've got the, the money, that is the time to really go into debt and to have all the things that you couldn't afford when you're in your 20s or in your 30s. But that's a mistake because when you are in your 40s now, you are beginning to plateau into your 50s and then after your 50s, you've got to leave your job. So when you are in your 40s, you should really be starting the, the, the process of consolidating what you have and avoiding debt if you can. Because if you're taking a debt when you're in your mid-40s, um, if you're only starting to take a mortgage when you're in your mid-40s, come retirement age, you're still going to be paying for that bond. And you won't be um, free to leave your employment or as soon as you leave employment you are going to have to use your one third on your pension plan to pay the balance of your mortgage whereas if you had done that when you're in your 30s by the time you leave your job you've actually paid off your bond what do we mean by consolidation mm -hmm. um financial terms that we may need to demystify 
Okay, consolidating means bringing everything under your one eye. I'm using it very simplistically to mean bringing everything under your eye because the, the lives that we have, you've got several de deaths running at the same time. And when you've got them running at the same time, it's not easy for you to see the true impact. If you bring um, all of your debts under one piece of paper, you can see that I'm paying for this and this and that and that. And do I really need to be paying for all of these things? Part of what I'm paying for is a duplication. But if you never bring it together like that, it's all sitting in different areas and you're not really seeing the full impact. So what I mean by that is that you need to consciously now draw everything, put it onto one page so that you look at it and you think, maybe this is a duplication. I've got three life insurance policies. I don't really need a funeral plan or I don't really need this plan because it's embodied in the other plan. So it's doing more or less the same thing. It's time for you to bring all of those things together and make that comparison. And if you find that you are duplicating things, I know that people who've got four or five policies, and because life insurance is so long term, they've put their policies away. So they've even forgotten what these policies are doing. But if you take time in your 40s to revisit some of these things, you may even find that you've got the same policy, exactly the same cover, two or three times with different providers, which doesn't really um, help you in any way. Whereas you could have been using that money um, getting, buying yourself a piece of land so that when you retire you've got this nice piece of land to build a nice home for you and uh, freedom for the grandchildren. But instead you've got it sitting in a drawer three times over and you don't know it. The financial services sector in Botswana has changed dramatically these past few years, with a lot of new players and new products now available. Could any of these be of great benefit to Botswana that for now are still relatively unfamiliar and underutilized? You are right, the financial services sector has changed and the financial services sector has also made it very easy to spend money. Um, for example, if you've got a card, you know, you're spending money, you don't feel anything. Before we had our bank cards, every time you took out a note from your purse, you looked at it before you handed it over to the next person. But these days it's so automatic. You give them the card, the money comes out of the card, you don't feel anything. The other thing is that we've got these different cards that we don't quite understand how they work. So you find there are still people who don't understand the difference between a credit card and a debit card. If you are using a credit card, you are using the bank's money. If you are using a, a debit card, you are using your own money. So there are people who don't understand very basic um, differences like that. And so using money and consuming um, higher purchase schemes, um, you take, buy one, we'll give you the other for free. There is no free. The price of that other has already been included in several other things that have been, have been bought by other people. So you, you have all of these marketing um, messaging that makes it very, very, very easy for you to, to spend money. And then it makes it even more cumbersome for you to save because there's so much pressure on you for this money to be, to be spent. But the long and short of that is that even though there are many players in the market now, I think it's a good thing because it actually gives people uh, an opportunity and a variety to make choices. Um, you may find that in the history of, let's take insurance for example, you may find that people historically were buying products from one or two providers because that's what they had. But now if you've got a lot of providers in the market, it forces um, all the providers to be on their toes and to be competitive. And once they're competitive, it's the, co it's the consumer that sort of um, benefits from that. But I think I'd like to underscore the fact that with the products that are new in the market or pro products that people should start thinking more about, it's the pension product because a pension product is, is something that has not been very common in this market. We do have pension products now, but what they can do or what they do for you is that they help you secure your future when you are no longer employed. 
So those people that are working for small companies that are basically paying gratuities at the end of a contract, those are the type of people that should be looking at getting pension, pensions because with your gratuity, you build your stop nonsense. Wahoraka, another car, you go to Foshini and buy new clothes and it's all well and good. But the fact of the matter is that that gratuity is not coming back. Once you've spent it, you won't have it by the time you reach 60. Other than these new pension products, our expert says mortgage protectors and annuity products are a great way to secure one's future in these uncertain times. The second critical product is a mortgage protector. And this, um, as the name suggests, is that the reality is that we can't build our houses um, using our own money. So we all almost invariably have to go to the bank for a mortgage. A mortgage protector is a life insurance policy that actually protects you if anything should happen to you while you've got a mortgage. So if you should die or become disabled or become retrenched, then the mortgage um, protector can help you clear the balance of what is left on your, on your mortgage so that your children don't have to worry about losing your, the family house. That's another very key product that I think people should be, should be looking into. The third product um, that I think people should be looking into is an annuity product. An annuity product is a product that allows you to take a lump sum of money and put it aside into this product and then walk away from it. You can top it up as you please, but you can walk away from the annuity product for the next 10 years while it works for you and then you start drawing down on it um, on, on year 11. So that's a very good thing for people that, uh, for instance, are being paid gratuities because then you can put your lump sum in, into, into a product of that nature. So these are the key three products that I think really should be helping people out when we're talking about the future. There's many products that are helping people for now. And I'm not going to talk about that because I don't think that that is what society is concerned about. Society is not concerned about having money to spend now. That, that's a given. Society is more concerned about the people that don't make sufficient savings and become a burden on their children, a burden on society, and a burden on the government going forward. And those are the type of products that I was talking about in order for you to be able to avoid those type of traps. Welcome back to First Issues as we conclude our conversation with Dr. Kiram Bagat as to the economic cost of the diabetes epidemic. An estimated 30 million people worldwide had diabetes in 1985. By 1995, this number had shot up to 135 million. The World Health Organization estimates that this number will increase to at least 300 million by 2025. Diabetes is projected to become one of the world's main disablers and killers within the next 25 years. According to the experts, a diabetes epidemic is underway. Reports indicate that as the number of people with diabetes grows worldwide, the disease takes an ever-increasing portion of national health care budgets. It is an expensive disease to treat, costing the United States 244 billion US dollars in 2012, according to an analysis of the disease's economic burden. When the loss of productivity due to illness and disability is added in, the bill comes to $322 billion. Our returning guest, Dr. Kiran Bhagat, says Botswana, as a middle-income country, simply cannot afford the consequences the Americans and Europeans are going through, and the economic burden will eventually fall upon individual families. Welcome back to First Issues. Our conversation tonight reveals that the first step to taking responsibility for your health and therefore your very livelihood is learning the difference between real healthy food and harmful chemically processed foods. Our guest this evening says it is simple. If you cannot pronounce the names of the chemicals used as ingredients in a product, 
Simply do not buy and consume it. With the right education, consumers will not fall victim to false advertising, which goes as far as to market sugary, sickness-inducing foods as healthy. I would say the cornerstone of diabetic management is prevention. If we're going to prevent, it's eating healthy. And the trouble, you have quite rightly said, is, is we're eating processed foods. We're eating foods that come in a box. We're eating foods that we buy in a supermarket. We're eating foods that are calorie rich, that are, that are fat rich, that are salt rich, that are sugar rich. And as a result, we're, we're talking about uh, the culpability, if you like, lies with the food industry that is inveigling, they're, 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 they're convincing our public to buy foods which are processed, that are packed with foods, contents that are simply unhealthy. We're talking about the energy drinks, we're talking about the, 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 the fizzy drinks, we're talking about uh, bread, we're talking about rice, we're talking about mealy meal, we're talking about um, canned uh, fruits, we're talking about fruit juices, we're talking about the yogi sips, we're talking about the yogurts. Often many of these things are being sold to us as healthy when actually they've got incredibly high content of sugar. And you, you look at the tuck shops that our school children are being uh, 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 visiting in terms of their, their, their breaks. You look, you look at the, the fast food outlets with, that are selling some of these foods. They are packed, packed with sugar, energy dense, and they're causing obesity and they're causing diabetes. What is most distressing in this scenario is that we are passing on a bad lifestyle and eating habits and thus this terrible disease to the younger generation who are at the mercy of our bad choices. We used to term this type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes. We've actually stopped using that term because we are no longer seeing it in adults. We're beginning to see it in younger and younger populations. We are seeing type 2 diabetes in children as, as, as young as 9 and 10 because of the phenomenal obesity that we're seeing. You just have to wind down the window and look at school, look at children going to school and look at the size of those children's stomachs. You just have to visit the primary schools and see what they are eating, see what is in their lunchbox and you know that we are poisoning their plate. You, we, you know that we are causing diseases that should not be occurring in that population. So the, the question is very relevant and very germane and unfortunately it's no longer an adult condition. It is the condition that is pervading the, 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 the teenager population and the younger population therein. So we've got to wake up to this, this epidemic that's, that's on our doorstep. World Bank figures say Botswana has 1.8 hospital beds for every 1,000 people, a total of about 3,880 nationwide. If Dr. Bagat was to hazard a guess, how many of these are currently occupied by diabetes patients? Those patients with, that are admitted with diabetes inevitably if they're coming to hospital will have blood pressure so their blood pressure will be out of control they may have heart failure where the heart has begun to fail they may have kidney issues where the kidneys are not regulated very well they may have as a result of obesity arthritis issues the number of people that we see who are admitted with a heart attack and we so happen to measure their sugar and for the first time they're diagnosed with diabetes because nobody's bothered to check the sugar the number of people that are admitted in an orthopedic ward who are undergoing a hip replacement or a knee replacement because they have arthritis because they're overweight as a result, the bones have actually become worn and torn, and you measure their sugar, and their sugar is high. The number of people that come in with uncontrolled uh, blood pressure, and for the first time you measure their sugar, and their sugar is high. The number of people that come in with um, end-stage kidney failure, and you measure it, and the cause is sugar. The number of people that come in with a stroke, and you measure it for the first time, and the sugar is high. So it's very difficult, because the equation becomes muddied, because these are all lifestyle conditions, and they all occur and run in tandem. And which presents first is debatable because all of them are rushing to present themselves to you to, to, to give you that warning sign. So listen to your body. It will tell you that you're, you know, people expect to be well by swallowing all these sort of green teas and orange teas and it doesn't work. You've got to take the pill of exercise. You've got to take the pill of lifestyle. That is where you start. So in terms of the consequences of diabetes, in terms of the cost implications, it's phenomenal. You know, we don't have, again, statistics for Southern Africa, but we know from the World Health Organization that in, uh, in America, America in, in, in 2000, it cost the Americans almost a hundred billion dollars in terms of the complications of diabetes. And the complications of diabetes, don't forget, is not just on the individual. In terms of the individual, it's the cost of the medication, it's, a, it's the cost of the injections, it's the cost of the caregiver, making sure that, that, care, that, that the patient is well. It's the, the indirect costs are the hospital costs, the cost of admitting the patient into hospital, giving them a drip, the, the nurse cost, the doctor cost, the bed cost. 
the complication costs in terms of cataracts, in terms of amputations, and then the economic costs. If somebody is diabetic and is 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 is, is working in in an institution, the the, the absenteeism, the sick days, the fact that they're not able to focus because their sugars are under control, are not under control, the fact that they they may need to take time off to go and see the doctor. So all the consequences of work-related diabetes and the impact of diabetes at work have not been gauged adequately in our country. But I can bet your bottom pula that if they if we compare what the Americans are going through, we're going through the same uh, situation. But unfortunately, our, our situation is we are a middle-income country. We cannot afford the consequences of the same things that the Americans have gone through or the Europeans have gone through. They have the wherewithal. We don't have it. So the consequences are then on the family. So the family suffers, the anxiety, the stress, the depression on the spouse or the husband or the wife or the children who have to look after that one person that is either insulin dependent or taking medication or has had a complication from diabetes is phenomenal. Health fads come and go and herbal teas are the current craze. However, do these supposed health teas have any benefits against diabetes? Green tea is, has got what are called polyphenols. Polyphenols are antioxidants and they do work. They're, they're very good in terms of working together in dropping your blood pressure. So they are very good for you, but they are not a substitute for healthy eating. You will often find somebody who will, for example, not take tea, uh, sugar with their tea, but will have a cake. Or will have tea without sugar, but have a biscuit. It doesn't work, you know, or we'll have green tea, but we'll have half a chocolate cake. Or we'll have green tea, but not exercise. Or we'll take a cholesterol pill, but we'll eat uh, nama with mahura. You know, you, you, it doesn't work. You know, it's cheese and chalk. You've got to follow a uniformly consistent diet. Yes, there, is a, there, there, there are space for the jasmine tea and the green tea and, of course, some of the multivitamins on the market, but they are not a substitute. People believe that if they take these supplements and nutraceuticals, as we call it, uh, they are a substitute for healthy eating. It doesn't work like that. Uh, you've got, there, there is no magic bullet. For those eager to start making the right life decisions, our guests give suggestions for healthier day-to-day -day eating. They can eat any one of a number of compounds and you can split them. You know, this sort of colonial habit where we have to have toast and eggs and, 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 and sausages and, you know, should be thrown out the window. You can, eat, you can eat your veggies in the morning, you can eat your salad in the morning, you can eat fruit in the morning. I'm talking about whole fruit, not fruit juice. I'm talking about nuts, I'm talking about eggs, I'm talking about avocados, I'm talking about ground nuts, I'm talking about almonds. Uh, you name it, you can have a number of permutations. I'm talking about meat, I'm talking about eggs, I'm talking about milk, I'm talking about cheese. You can eat all those foods as long as you cut your carbohydrates. If you cut your carbohydrates because they are the source of the, of the problem, we increasingly are beginning to, to, to understand that it's not, it's not the fat that is, 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 is the poison, it's the sugar. If you look at the North Americans, they have cut their incidence of cholesterol substantially, but the incidence of heart disease and obesity has gone up. And the reason why is the food industry has switched from uh, diets high in fat to diets low in fat. But if I gave you food that was low in fat but didn't have any sugar, you wouldn't eat it because it wouldn't taste good. So they've substituted the fat with sugar. So if you look at, for example, a low-fat low yogurt, it'll have no or low fat in it, but the amount of calories in it is very high. If you look at a lot of these milkshakes that are on the market in the supermarkets, they will, they will write on their 100% fruit or 100% whatever it is, but it's got the amount of sugar in it is phenomenal. So I would, I would urge the public out there to cut their sugar, to cut their processed carbohydrates. Basically, if you cannot understand the label on a box, because many of these boxes have very complicated chemical names in them, if you cannot even pronounce the name of that chemical, don't buy that box.